Hello everyone and welcome to the Celiac Disease Program at Children's National Hospital. I'm Vanessa Weisbrod, the Executive Director of our program, and I'm excited to meet with you all today to go through our Getting Started on a Gluten-Free Diet presentation. If at any time along the way you have questions, um, you can always send them to me through the chat function. If we don't get through everyone's questions today, they will all get emailed to us at the end and you will get a personal email response back. So don't worry if we don't cover them all during the course of the next hour. Hour. Also, don't worry about taking a bunch of notes. On the left-hand side of your screen, you should be able to download the presentation as well as the handouts that we talk about along the way. And you know, as always, our team is here to help you through the transition to the gluten-free diet and you know, from day one through day 10,000. Um, so you can always reach out to us by email at celiac at childrensnational.org. So let's get started. So the first thing that I want everybody to do is, if you haven't done so yet, is to download our Celiac Programs digital app. This is a free app that's available in the iTunes store or in the Android marketplace, and it has all of our resources available. Everything that we talk about in our sessions, in the clinic, today, all of those resource materials are always available through the app. We also have registration for our community-based events, our peer mentorship groups, our webinars, um, access to our podcast, and all of the information that you'll need about living a gluten-free lifestyle. So um, you can scan that QR code or look for the GF icon in the uh, respective app stores. So let's talk a little bit about celiac disease. Um, as you should hopefully know by now, celiac is an immune-mediated disorder that causes damage to the villi of the small intestines when we eat gluten. And when we do this, it prevents the body from absorbing nutrition that's found in the food that we eat. About one in 100 people in the United States has celiac disease, which means that it's actually one of the most common diseases that happens in our country. As you know, the damage to your gut is caused by gluten, which is a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. So those are the three grain groups that you're going to have to avoid eating. When you eat gluten and you have celiac disease, your body sees it as something that is unsafe, and it sends these helper cells to try and get rid of it. But what ends up happening is that it attacks your body unnecessarily and causes lots of problems. So this is, these are pictures of your intestines. And what I want to show you from these pictures is what happens to a person with celiac disease. So those long, very tall um, curves are called villi, and the tall ones are healthy villi, and that's what they should look like. Be, think of them as fingers that are floating around in your guts, pulling in the nutrition from the food that you eat to help you grow strong. When you have celiac disease and you're eating gluten, those villi get damaged and flattened like you see in column three, where they're much more flat. And as they're flat, they have a lot of difficulty absorbing the nutrition from the food that we eat. And so that's when we start having problems. But the good news is that once you go on a gluten-free diet, your gut heals and they get tall again and able to absorb all of the food that you're eating. So that's why we want to stick to a gluten-free diet so that our villi can get very tall again and bring in all of that nutrition. So what happens when the body is not nourished? Other conditions and diseases can happen, which complicate um, the quality of life for people with celiac disease. If we don't treat celiac disease, injury can happen in almost every system of the body. It can affect our bones, it can um, affect reproduction, cause neurological symptoms, skin rashes. Those are just a few of over 300 symptoms that have been re related to celiac disease. So what happens if you eat gluten? So there's no treatment or drug or anything to stop a reaction once gluten has been ingested. That's why it's really important that we avoid gluten if we have celiac disease. The good news is that you won't experience anaphylactic shock if you eat gluten, but it's likely that you will experience some other symptoms. Um, and it's important to remember that eating gluten can also cause long-term damage. Now, one of the most common questions we ask is that if I eat gluten, how long am I gonna feel bad? Well, the answer is that we don't really know. 
Some people have no symptoms at all. And in other people, they have very um, dramatic and debilitating symptoms that can last from a few hours to several days or even up to a week. So it really varies by person. And even within your own life, it can change. So we hear lots of stories that at one point in life, the reaction was one way. And 10 years later, that person eats gluten and may feel very differently than they did when they were first diagnosed. So what happens now that you're diagnosed? Those antibodies that were in your blood, they should begin to go down and your gut should start to heal. We want to see the antibodies coming down by your six month follow up, but in many people, it can take one year or even more to totally normalize. Now, many of you were diagnosed in the last week or two, so being on a gluten free diet, you may have already started to feel better, um, but some of you may not. Some people respond really quickly to the diet and say within a few weeks their symptoms feel so much better, but for others, it might take months. So, you know, there's lots of information online saying that, oh, you should wake up one week after being gluten free and feel like a new person. And that's not true for everybody. So what does follow up care? look like. So all of you will be visiting our multidisciplinary clinic in the very near future. Then following that, you'll have a three-month visit with our dietitian, then a six-month follow-up with the whole team, and a 12-month follow-up with the whole team. After that 12-month follow-up, you'll come back annually for follow-up visits. And I can't stress how important it is to come in for those follow-up visits. We know that celiac disease is related to lots of other conditions and that oftentimes those conditions come up down the road far after diagnosis. So it is very important that we check your nutritional levels every year, that we make sure that you're growing and that we make sure that you haven't developed any of those potential other diseases that come along with celiac disease. And we'll schedule the next three visits at your initial clinic visit. So now what is gluten? Gluten is a protein and it's found in all forms of wheat, rye, and barley. It's most commonly found in food, but it can also be used in medications, vitamins, cosmetics, shampoos and conditioners, and many school supplies. So we have to be careful and we always have to be checking labels. So there are a few labels that help us. Uh, sorry, laws that help us. The first is the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act, which we call FELCPA. This went into law in 2004 and was implemented in 2006, and it covers the labeling of milk, eggs, wheat, fish, shellfish, peanuts, tree nuts, and soy. And what it means is that the allergens must appear in very plain language on the label and be very easy to identify. So it could be identified in the ingredients list. So it might say flour with wheat in parentheses. There could be a contain statement that says wheat, or it could be an incidental additive. So something like glucose syrup and in parentheses next to it would say wheat. So this is great because it does help us easily identify wheat. However, this law does not cover rye and barley because those two ingredients are not considered common allergens. So when you look at those ingredient statements, you will never see rye and barley fall on them, which is why you're gonna to have to read the full ingredients label, which we're gonna go through in a second. So what does a food label look like? This is a um, generic food label, and you can see in the ingredients list that the first ingredient is whole grain wheat. So it's very clearly spelled out at the top for you that wheat is there, but there is also an allergy statement at the bottom where it says that that product contains wheat ingredients. So in this case, it was very easy to identify. Here is a bag of goldfish, and you can see that the contained statement very easily identifies wheat and milk as ingredients in the product. But there are all of these other names for wheat that we need to be aware of. The good news is that if any of these ingredients are included in a product, it would have to also say contains wheat on that contained statement. So let's look at another label. So these are spelt bagels. Now spelt is a very commonly um, missed item on our knowledge assessment. Spelt is a form of wheat, but it also has a, um, a lower gluten content in some cases than other forms of wheat. So oftentimes manufacturers will advertise their product as low gluten when they're made with spelt. This is not safe for a person with celiac disease. So if you see the word spelt, it is unsafe. So as you can see on the label here, it says whole spelt is an ingredient and then in parentheses next to it, it says wheat. So that would 
let you know that it does contain wheat and that it is unsafe. For barley, there are several other forms of barley. Uh, the most common one that we see is malt extract, malt flavoring, and malt vinegar. These are things that you're definitely going to want to avoid, so become familiar with all of these words. These are also listed in our app, so you'll never have to worry about um, being on your own with them. You can always look in the app for this list. So I wanna talk for a minute about malt because malt is a sweetener that is traditionally made from barley. It's a little bit confusing because as the gluten-free industry has gotten bigger and bigger over the years, manufacturers have learned that you can malt any grain. And the, the process of malting, it includes soaking the grains in water, then drying them in hot air, and then converting the starches from the grain into a sugar, which can then be used as a sweetener in lots of different foods. So while barley is most often used as the malted grain, there are some grains that are malted that are gluten-free. In gluten-free products, you'll see things like malted sorghum and malted brown rice, and even malted fruits in some cases. But what's really important is that if you see that there is an ingredient called malt in a product, unless it specifies that it is a gluten-free grain like sorghum or rice, you should assume that it's made from barley and that it is not safe for a gluten-free diet. So for example, Rice Krispies is a very common cereal that we eat. And as you can see on the ingredients list, it contains rice, sugar, salt, and malt flavor, but it does not identify the source of the malt. In this case, it is from barley and therefore not safe for a gluten-free diet. The good news is that there are lots of other rice cereals that look just like Rice Krispies that are made using gluten-free ingredients. So just make sure to look for those gluten-free labels. So I want to talk about one other type of um, barley. So we, we talk a lot about um, brown rice syrup and whether it's safe or not. So there are some cases when it is and some cases where it is not. So here you can see three examples. In the first one on the left, the rice cereal, that product is labeled as gluten-free. If you then look down at the ingredients list, you see organic brown rice, organic brown rice syrup, honey, and sea salt, but no mention of any type of malted barley in there. So what's good is that the manufacturer has labeled this cereal as gluten-free. So you can now make the assumption that the brown rice syrup that was used is a gluten-free brown rice syrup and that it's malted from brown rice. So that product would be safe. However, in the next example, you see that this product contains rice, rice flour, water, brown rice syrup. This brown rice syrup is made from brown rice, malted barley, and water. So in this case, the brown rice syrup is not safe for a gluten-free diet, so that product is not okay. But now we get to the third product where there's no gluten-free label and it just contains brown rice syrup with no identification of the origin of it. So what do we do in this situation? The first step is to contact the manufacturer or to look on their website to see if there's any information about the gluten-free status. If you can't easily find out, we would recommend not eating it. Um, there's no identification and no quick information about it, so it's better to avoid that product and pick a different barbecue sauce that identifies itself as gluten-free. So with rye, there are only a few names for rye. There's rye flour, rye bread, rye flavoring. Thankfully, rye is not used as a sweetener or a thickening agent, so it's much easier to identify and it's found in far fewer places. So I wanna talk about oats because they're a huge controversy in the gluten-free world. Oats in their natural form are gluten-free. They're used in many foods, oatmeal, snack bars, granolas, veggie burgers, cookie muffins, breads, lots of different things. But there are a few issues that we run into with oats and celiac disease. Some patients with celiac disease may have a true um, intolerance to the protein in oats that's called avenin. The avenin protein is actually very similar in structure to the gluten protein, and some people with celiac disease just can't tolerate it and have a reaction that feels like a gluten reaction when they eat oats. Certified gluten-free oats are safe, but it's really under important to understand the manufacturing process and where cross-contamination can happen with oats. 
So in the middle here, you see a picture of an oat field. What happens is that most often oats are grown adjacent to barley fields and wheat fields. The wind blows and the grains blow in the wind and they contaminate each other's fields. So most often oats grown in a traditional environment are contaminated just in the growing process. There's also times when oats are, um, they, there's cross contact when they're transported, when they're harvested and when they're processed. So if you see an oat product that does not say gluten-free on it, they are likely unsafe and should not be eaten by a person with celiac disease. However, there are two types of oats that are safe for people with celiac disease. The first is called purity protocol oats. These are grown from pure and uncontaminated fields that have not been adjacent to wheat, in the la wheat, rye, or barley for the last three years. They are seeded and harvested using dedicated machinery and they're transported using thoroughly cleaned equipment. Then they're processed in a dedicated gluten-free facility and extensively tested for gluten contamination. The second type are mechanical or optical sorted oats. And what these do is the oats are actually grown in the normal fields where there is a chance of contamination. But this mechanical or optical sorting process sorts the oats and removes all of the wheat, rye, and barley from the oats. Then they are cleaned and then they are harvested and transported to a uh, clean and gluten-free facility for processing. There are, there's almost no way to determine in a grocery store if you are buying a product that has puree protocol oats or mechanically sorted oats. What you need to look for is a gluten-free label on oat products. If the product has a gluten-free stamp on them, then they are oats that a person with celiac disease can eat. So just please always be looking for that gluten-free label. So what should you practically know about the consumption of oats? Before reintroducing oats to the diet, a person with celiac disease should be stable on the gluten-free diet. You should not be experiencing any symptoms, and we would like to see a trend towards a, towards a normalized antibody level. If you eat oats and you experience symptoms, the first thing we wanna do is confirm the gluten-free status of the oats that you're eating. We wanna take oats out of the diet, stabilize, and then reintroduce with a different certified oat product to determine the cause of their reaction. So now we're going to talk a little bit about food labeling with our gluten-free professor. Um, there is a law for the FDA that regulates the labeling of gluten-free. It specifies that a product labeled as gluten-free must not contain wheat, rye, or barley, or any derivatives of those ingredients, or be processed to contain less than 20 parts per million gluten. We're going to watch a little video right now to tell us a little bit more. regulated by the FDA may be labeled gluten-free if it does not contain wheat, rye, barley, or their crossbred hybrids like triticale, a gluten-containing grain, or it contains a gluten-containing grain or an ingredient derived from a gluten-containing grain that has been processed to less than 20 parts per million of gluten. It's so confusing. Never fear, the gluten-free professor is here to help you understand. The FDA gluten-free labeling law requires that if a manufacturer labels the product as gluten-free, that it must not contain wheat, rye, or barley, or any derivatives of those ingredients, or be processed to contain less than 20 parts per million this is what 20 parts per million looks like. This is 20 pieces of sand in a pile of 1 million pieces of sand. 20 parts of gluten per 1 million parts of food sample is an accepted standard in many parts of the world for products that are labeled gluten-free. But what does 20 parts of sand in 1 million actually mean when it comes to my son's breakfast? Let's break it down. We know that 20 parts per million is a suitable threshold for gluten-free products. Why? The FDA developed these standards based on two factors, 
sensibility of the tests to detect gluten in food, and evidence-based research from clinical trials and analytical studies conducted by some of the most respected celiac disease experts in the United States and around the world. Let's take a look. While there are tests to detect as low as five parts per million gluten in food, there is lots of irregularity in the margin of error on these tests. If the level was set at five parts per million with a 10 to 20% margin of error, food manufacturers would have little flexibility to produce tasty and safe products. So the threshold is set based on making things taste good? Not exactly. This is where the science comes in. Research led by Dr. Alessio Fasano at the Center for Celiac Research shows that the vast majority of people suffering from celiac disease can have up to 10 milligrams a day of gluten with no reaction. Translated to parts per million, that is equal to more than one pound of gluten-free products containing 20 parts per million of food. This is what 10 milligrams looks like one-eighth a teaspoon of flour, or 18 slices of bread with each slice containing 20 parts per million of gluten. Voluntary labeling. Now, it's important to remember that there are thousands of products in a grocery store that are naturally gluten-free or are manufactured using gluten-free ingredients that will not have a gluten-free label. You mean there are things that are gluten-free that don't say it on the package? Yes. The FDA law is a voluntary rule, which means that a company doesn't have to label their product as gluten-free unless they want to and have tested it to make sure it complies with the 20 parts per million standard. The bottom line is that you always need to check food labels. If there is any question, contact a manufacturer directly to find out how the product is made. Okay, so we understand the grocery store. But when we go to a restaurant that has a gluten-free menu, can we assume that the 20 parts per million rule applies to them as well? No, the 20 parts per million rule would only apply to the packaged goods a restaurant purchases that are labeled gluten-free. There is no rule requiring a restaurant to test the food they serve to customers. The gluten-free menu simply informs you that the restaurant has options they deem to be gluten-free. So how will we know if there is cross-contamination that is less than or more than 20 parts per million? There are no current laws regulating how a restaurant prepares and handles food in relation to gluten, which means you always need to ask questions to ensure your food is prepared in a safe way to prevent cross-contamination. Ah, got it. Let's recap what we learned today. The FDA gluten-free labeling law requires that if a manufacturer labels their product as gluten-free, that it must not contain wheat, rye, or barley, or any derivatives of those ingredients, or be processed to contain less than 20 parts per million gluten. The law is voluntary, so all gluten-free products may not have a specific gluten-free label. The 20 parts per million threshold was developed using high quality scientific data that came from leading celiac disease experts. Thanks, Professor. All right, so we hope that video was helpful to you. And I just wanna to touch on a couple of things that we heard about in the video. So first of all, this idea of voluntary labeling. So even though there is a gluten-free labeling rule, it is voluntary, which means that even if a product is gluten-free, the manufacturer is not required to label it as gluten-free. So this means that there are thousands of items that are naturally gluten-free in grocery stores that might not have a gluten-free label, but are still safe for people with celiac disease to eat. So this might be things like fresh fruits and vegetables, milk, popcorn, potato chips, cheese. Now, it's always important that we look at the food label of packaged products. So if you pick up a package of popcorn, you're definitely gonna wanna look at the label just to make sure that there isn't anything added to it. But just be aware 
that there are lots of food items in grocery stores that are safe for a gluten-free diet, even if they don't say the words gluten-free on the package. There are also lots of gluten-free labels that exist in the world, but it's important to know that there's no national gluten-free certification. There are lots and lots of different companies that choose to display the term gluten-free however they want on their package as long as it meets the FDA standard. So all of these labels that you see on the screen right now were developed by different companies that are independent certifiers, in quotes, um, of gluten-free. So they all have their own methods of testing products and looking at how they want to identify products as gluten-free, and they are not all the same. So it does not matter what gluten-free label you see. If the words gluten-free appear on a package, they must all meet the same FDA standard. So one is not better than another. So up on the screen now is a list of gluten-free ingredients. I don't expect you to memorize this list. This list is in our digital app and you can refer to it anytime. But what I just wanna point out is that there are tons of foods that are naturally gluten-free and safe for the gluten-free diet. So there are far more than you can eat than you can't. So I know it's overwhelming, but I think it's sometimes helpful to look at this list and just be like, wow, there's so many things that my family can eat. These are, this is a list of food additives, and I definitely do not expect you to remember every item on this list. Again, it's available um, under gluten-free re diet resources in the app, and you can always refer to this list when you're trying to determine if a product is safe. Now, there are quite a few questionable products that require you to double check labels at, or in some cases to contact food manufacturers. These are things like broths and soups, candies, communion wafers, different types of dried nuts, french fries, um, gravies, drink mixes, imitation seafoods, processed meats. Um, these are all examples of things that you're going to want to double check where gluten often is used, but not always. Modified food starch. So this is a very common question that we get. And in the United States and Canada, if a food starch is made from wheat, it must say so because of that Food Allergy Labeling and Consumer Protection Act, FALPA. In general, the word starch refers to cornstarch, which is safe for a gluten-free diet. And the good news is that rye and barley are not used to make food starch. So wheat is the only one that we would have to watch out for. And if it's used, the label must identify it. Distillation is another um, common misconception. So products that are distilled have proteins that are too large to pass through the distillation process. So when we distill something, the proteins are stripped. All vinegars are distilled and are therefore gluten-free, with the exception of malt vinegar, which contains added malt from barley. The same rule applies to liquors that are distilled. So any distilled liquor would also be gluten-free. Um, it's important to note that beer is not distilled, so don't be confused. Beer is fermented and fermentation does not strip the protein. There are also lots of other sources of gluten. Gluten appears in things like Play-Doh, hand sanitizer, cosmetics, medication, art supplies, shampoo, and even dog food. So we definitely wanna be mindful of these things. Um, you can see this is a popular brand of hand sanitizer and it is made using wheat extract. So as well, it's important to know that you're not going to eat hand sanitizer. We would never wanna eat something like hand sanitizer or Play-Doh or makeup. However, you put these things on your hands and sometimes on your face. And if there is any chance that these items would be ingested, that's when they become a problem. So if you have a young child who is putting on hand sanitizer and then going to eat, you're gonna to wanna to use one that is gluten-free and does not have wheat extract in it. Also, it's important to know that there's no evidence that gluten can be absorbed through the skin. So if there is gluten in something like lotion that you're putting on, you are not going to absorb it through your gut the same way if you would eat it. So what about gluten and medications? Gluten is used as an excipient to bind pills together. There are several kinds of excipients, one of which is wheat starch. It's considered an inactive ingredient, and so there are no regulations in the United States regarding the labeling of inactive substances in medicine. The good news, though, is that we recently got guidance from the FDA 
saying that the amount of gluten in a medication or a single pill is less than the amount of gluten that could potentially be found in a single serving of a cookie labeled as gluten-free that meets the FDA's 20 parts per million regulation. So that's really good news. The other thing we know is that as of when we put this presentation together, there were only 13 known prescription drugs that contain wheat, according to Pillbox, which is run through the National Library of Medicine and is a really great resource. It's also really important to understand that excipients can change regularly by a lot, actually. So you always want to be double checking for medications that you take on an ongoing basis. The best place to find out if a medication is safe is through glutenfreedrugs.com. You can visit it from any website. Uh, it's also linked directly through our digital app, so you can also find it there. So let's talk about preventing cross-contamination in a shared kitchen. Um, some of you will have a kitchen that is totally gluten-free. Others will have a shared kitchen where there is gluten-containing products for members of the family who don't need to be gluten-free. The most critical thing that we can share with you about preventing cross-contact is that proper cleaning is vitally important. I want you all to think about if you were to have raw chicken on your countertop. If you can clean your surfaces in your kitchen and your pots and pans well enough to get rid of bacteria from raw chicken, you can also clean well enough to get rid of gluten. So cleaning is key. In a shared kitchen, we always want to prepare gluten-free foods first. If you must prepare gluten-free foods simultaneously or right after gluten-containing foods, as I said, you always want to wash your pots and pans, dishes, utensils, and cutting boards before preparing the gluten-free foods. And again, if you can get rid of bacteria in the kitchen, you can also remove gluten. One other point is about condiments, spreads, and butters. Don't double dip. If you're going to use those condiments on gluten-containing and gluten-free, we do recommend having separate ones or using squeeze bottles so that you're not dipping a knife in, touching gluten, and then putting it back into the, whatever the condiment is. In most cases, it's easier to have two versions. So I wanna look at a little bit of data from our program. We've done a lot of research on cross-contamination and I wanna share just a little bit of this with you. So we had a study published in the journal Gastroenterology um, that looked at shared toasters. What we found is that shared toasters are actually a really low risk for cross-contact and that pop-up toasters and toaster ovens are okay in a shared home kitchen. This does not apply to a restaurant or a cafeteria. We're only talking about home shared kitchens. As long as you wash pots and pans in between cooking gluten-containing and gluten-free pasta, there's a very low risk for cross-contact. So again, just wash in between and you will be okay. We did test slicing using the same knife to cut gluten-containing and gluten-free cupcakes. And again, the best practice was to wash the knife in between using with gluten-containing and gluten-free. Remember, hygiene is key. You always want to wash your hands and kitchen surfaces regularly. So I want to show you our, one of our experiments here. This was looking at cooking gluten-containing pasta first and then cooking gluten-free pasta in the same water right after. The red line that you see is the safe line. So as you can see, we cooked different types of pasta in gluten-containing pasta in water and then immediately cooked gluten-free pasta right after. And in all cases, there were dangerous levels of contamination to the gluten-free pasta. So what this tells us us is that we never want to share water for gluten-containing and gluten-free pasta. The good news is that we tried it again, but this time we washed the pots after cooking the gluten-containing pasta and put clean water in the pots. And this time you can see there was no gluten detected on any of the gluten-free pasta, which tells you that washing works and that we always want to wash in between use. This is our toaster test, again, um, in using uh, different types of toasters to toast gluten-free bread after toasting gluten-containing. All of them fell under that red line. So again, this is okay in a home kitchen environment, but not in a cafeteria or in a restaurant environment. 
So let's talk a little bit about dining in restaurants and share a few tips for a safe experience. First of all, we always recommend calling ahead to make sure that the restaurant can accommodate a gluten-free meal. You wanna to speak to the manager or the chef. We like to always suggest that talking to the person making your food is the best way to go because they're gonna know what they can really take care of in the kitchen. You should always be prepared to educate. Many restaurants are unfamiliar with preparing gluten-free meals, and in some cases that's okay, as long as you're ready to help them understand what safe foods are and safe preparation techniques. Again, hygiene is what's really important, that they're using clean utensils, clean surfaces, and clean pots and pans. We always recommend to have a plan for ordering it. So look at the menu ahead of time, pick a few things that look naturally gluten-free or of interest to you and ask the restaurants how they would be able to accommodate. Don't be afraid to ask questions. It is so important that you feel safe with the food that you're going to eat. And so ask as many questions as you need to in order to feel safe. Then say thank you be thankful and show the restaurant appreciation for making a safe meal for you. A little bit of kindness goes a really long way to helping our community continue to get safe food. So don't forget the saying thank you. So let's talk a little bit about celiac disease at school as it is quite a big deal. Celiac can greatly affect learning. Physical and emotional symptoms can negatively impact a child's ability to grow academically and socially. We're talking about, you know, having symptoms of the disease, having stomach aches or headaches or whatever their symptoms are when they eat gluten, and it can emotionally affect them to feel sick or to be worried about getting sick. These symptoms can be anxiety provoking, they can be embarrassing, painful, and distracting in a school setting. And in, in some cases, the, as a result of having symptoms or fear of becoming ill, some students may be unable or unwilling to attend school. These physical and emotional symptoms negatively impact a student's ability to focus, learn, and perform at their normal level, and in some cases have ne negative consequences due to unexcused absences and missed work. But all of this can be avoided by having proper accommodations in place for a child at school. And we believe that every child can go to school and fully participate in every learning activity and have a wonderful, social experience and educational experience at school. So let's talk a little bit about um, where kids get exposed to gluten at school. About 44% of children and teens with celiac report that they don't follow a strict gluten-free diet, and most often they consume gluten-free foods during meals with their peers, which often happens at school. They can come into exposure to gluten during class celebrations and cross contact with gluten-containing materials like Play-Doh and paper mache and obviously food in the cafeteria. We have done quite a bit of research looking into this and have found that Play-Doh and dry pasta pose very little risk for gluten exposure unless there is a risk of the child eating the materials directly. So unless you think that your child will eat these materials themselves, you should consider allowing them to use these materials in the classroom provided that they don't eat them and that they wash their hands and work surfaces after using them. However, with items like paper mache, cooked pasta that's wet, or home economics activities, there is a quite a big risk for gluten exposure. And for these situations, children with celiac disease really should use gluten-free materials only and have access to clean work environments. So these are some results from the studies we did. The first one is with Play-Doh. The black line is from transfer from the hands to gluten-free bread, and the gray line is transfer from the tables. So we really only had two samples that crossed that unsafe, to that unsafe threshold level, and both of those samples had little balls or pea-sized pieces of Play-Doh that were stuck to the bread. So what this tells us, again, is that children with celiac should not eat Play-Doh if they can see it, but that as long as there was no Play-Doh actually adhered to the bread, there were not unsafe levels from just touching and using the material. But the even better news is that after they washed their hands in the table, it didn't matter if they used just water, soap and water, or a wet wipe, there was no gluten transfer period. So what this tells us is that if your child is using a material that is dry or not sticky like Play-Doh or a dry pasta, that as long as they are washing their hands and surfaces afterwards, there's very, very little risk of any contamination from gluten. 
So we wanna consider these factors as we develop a plan for a child with celiac disease at school. And as I said, it is possible for a child with celiac disease to participate in every learning activity. We may just need to make a few modifications to the lesson plans so that everyone can have a safe and fulfilling school year. So there are a few laws and regulations that govern celiac disease at school. The first is the Americans with Disability Act of 1990, which defines a disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Eating and major bodily functions, including the digestive and immune systems, are included, which means that celiac disease qualifies for protection under this law. The next is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and this prohibits discrimination in any institution that receives federal financial assistance, including schools, on the basis of a disability. This requires institutions to provide educational programming that is designed to meet the student's individual educational needs as adequately as the needs of non-disabled students are met. So this requires that students with celiac disease require reasonable accommodations without drastically altering the structure of the educational institution. Our program has worked with hundreds of students with celiac disease in many school districts all over the United States. And in every case, there has been a way to find a reasonable accommodation for a child with celiac disease to participate in any learning activity. So it is very possible to have reasonable accommodations for students with celiac disease that allow them to fully participate. So how do we approach a safe school year? The first step is that you want to assess the services that your child's school already provides. You're going to want to work with the district, school, um, and school personnel to develop these plans. You want to have open and collaborative communication between your, your family, the school, and even the medical provider to make sure that we get really good accommodations in place. So there are a few types of plans that schools offer to students with health issues. The first is an individual education plan, which addresses learning issues. There's an individual health care plan. There is the emergency care plan, which would be something that a child with celiac disease wouldn't really need um, because it would be for a more of a medical emergency. And then a, a 504 plan, which is most appropriate for those with celiac disease. So, when you go to your school, the first step is going to be determine the type of plan that you're going to want to set up. Um, in most cases, you are going to set up a 504 plan. The only exception to this rule would be if your child has an existing education plan already in place where we can make adjustments to that education plan to accommodate celiac disease as well. Now, our program is here to help you. We have regularly scheduled seminars to go over this information. We have materials to educate schools and families, and it's all available through the app or through our website, childrensnational.org slash celiac. We can also participate in individual 504 plan meetings and advocacy efforts with you. All you need to do is email celiac at childrensnational.org. And we have regular ongoing trainings for schools, food service providers, and other types of learning environments, even in home daycare centers. So so please reach out as you need support. So I want to go through some of the action list items for parents as you're preparing for school year. The first thing you should do is notify your child's school, the principal, as well as the nurse, psychologist, or guidance counselor, and teachers that your child has celiac disease, either when you get the first diagnosis or when you go to enroll in the school year. As soon as you know they have celiac disease, you want to let them know. Then you wanna work with your child's care team to develop a celiac disease management plan. This might be a 504 plan, it might be a different type of plan depending on the school in which your child attends. You're gonna to wanna to permit the sharing of medical information necessary to keep your child safe. This should be shared between your school and your child's healthcare providers. You're gonna to wanna to make sure the school has accurate and current emergency contact information so that if your child is exposed to gluten at school or has any problems that they can get in touch with you. And it's very important that parents or guardians attend and participate in the annual meetings of the school health team to discuss implementing all of the accommodations that your child will receive at school. So before we sign off for today, I wanna to talk a little bit about how to talk about celiac disease with your friends and your family.
So we're gonna do a little bit of a role play today. So we hear all the time that grandmas can be difficult in managing celiac disease with their grandkids. So we're gonna talk about sort of a bad experience and turning it into a good one. So grandma says, you're all coming over for Sunday night pasta bake, right? You know that Brandon was just diagnosed with celiac disease and can't eat your gluten pasta anymore, says mom. Grandma goes, yes, but surely he can eat gluten once a week. There's nothing like my homemade spaghetti. It's family tradition. Mom replies, no, he can't eat it. We're just staying home. Grandma, I don't understand why this can't just be a pleasant family get together. We've done it every week for years. It's not like gluten is going to kill him. Mom slams the phone down. So unfortunately, this is quite a common scenario that we hear about of families getting into arguments, um, isolating themselves and not participating anymore after getting a celiac diagnosis. So we want to help from the beginning, teaching you how to frame the conversation in a way that might help others start to learn about celiac disease and also to be more accommodating to it. It might take a little bit of practice and a little bit of time, but with the right tone of voice and the right education, it can really help to make families support the child or whomever is diagnosed with celiac disease in a much better way. So let's see how we can reframe this conversation. Grandma, you're all coming over for the Sunday night pasta bake, right? Mom. We love coming over on Sundays, but you know Brandon was just diagnosed with celiac disease and we're just still figuring out this gluten-free diet. Grandma, yes, but surely he can eat gluten once a week. There's nothing like my homemade spaghetti. It's family tradition. So this is how mom is gonna rephrase to be a little bit more positive and a little bit more inclusive. We love the family tradition and all being together, but Brandon has been so sick and we just want to give his body time to heal. We really don't want him to eat gluten. The doctor told us it can lead to lots of complications, so we want to try to be as strict as we can with the diet. How about if I cook a large pot of gluten-free pasta at home and bring it over and then you can fix the spaghetti with the gluten-free pasta so we can all eat it together. And I'll even bring a box of gluten-free cookies from a new bakery in town. Grandma says, oh, I hadn't thought of that. I can easily use the gluten-free pasta. Great, we'll see you on Sunday. So by just reframing the conversation a little bit here, mom was able to educate grandma on why it's really important for her son to stick to the gluten-free diet so that we're preventing long-term health complications. And then she offered to bring a gluten-free alternative that everyone could eat together so that her son was included in the meal and that everyone could still partake in that family gathering. So it was a really nice way of reframing the conversation so that it ended in a positive way with everybody being included and still continuing the tradition. So how do we do this in any situation? If there's a negative or an excluding statement made, stop for a second and just pause and think about your response before speaking. It's really easy to get angry and to um, be defensive right off the bat. But think about how you can turn the situation into a positive one that's inclusive. So some ways to do that are offering to bring a gluten-free food, offer to be the host, suggest safe alternatives, and easy ways to substitute. And just remember to be calm in the situation because your calmness and your willingness to work at it really goes a long way. And then remember that the outcome might not be perfect at first, but afterwards, take a minute to reflect on the situation and how you might approach it differently next time. So the bottom line on all of this is that we always have to read food labels carefully. We have to ask lots of questions. And most importantly, we have to be an advocate. So for many of you, this is day one of living a gluten-free lifestyle, but day one is just the start and we are here for you. We do not expect you, your family to have a perfect gluten-free plan or lifestyle tomorrow. It's a process that's going to take time to adjust and our team is here to help you. Our community education team is available for you anytime that you need us. You can always reach us through the digital app. Of course, you can hit the contact button and email us that way. You can also email us th through um, our normal email, which is celiac at childrensnational.org, or you can reach out to any of us using the email addresses on your screen. There is no stupid question, and we are so happy to help with whatever it is that your family needs. 
So don't be shy, reach out. We are here for you. And I hope to see lots of you at our community events. We have activities for um, young children and families, teenagers, kids going to college, our annual education day. There are lots of activities to be involved in. And I truly hope that I will see lots of you at those soon. So again, if there are more questions, please send them our way. Otherwise, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day.